So here's a little big car. I call it little big since it's tiny on the outside but has a lion heart. Depending on which variant you choose to buy, you can go from a super economical diesel to this, the range topping 1 litre turbo petrol. And before we talk of anything else, let me tell you this, this car is loads and loads of unadulterated fun. My name is Ashish and I've had this car for exactly a year and I've driven it extensively during that time. So let me take you through a quick tour of what it offers. Around one year ago, I offered my thoughts about it for a car owner review channel and there have been further experiences since then. So keep watching to find out if this can be your next car. From the outside, there is no doubt that the venue is a smart and modern looking vehicle with its mini Creta-esque looks. However, what was dramatic last year seems to be regular and mundane now, especially in the wake of the latest gen Creta and more so the radical looking Kia Sonnet. The car is only as big as an i20, so not big in any respect, although the stance is taller. The front is dominated by the new Hyundai grille that gives it some aggression and is flanked by indicator lights that are sleek and take their place where one's headlights used to be in older designs. The DRL surround the low set headlamps in the bumper. This is especially an accident prone location for the headlamps and though I've been fortunate, it remains to be seen how they will fare long term in our bumper to bumper traffic conditions. The car looks quite compact when viewed in profile and this is where its true size betrays it. On the back, I like the BMW 1 series style tail lamps that are smoked in the higher versions of the car. The single shark fin antenna looks good but the rear is overall quite muted in terms of design when compared to the flamboyant front. The 1 litre mill is really really peppy and has a raspy engine note when revved hard. It does fill up the engine bay almost entirely despite its diminutive size. The layout is well thought of and neat. The engine sump is protected by a plastic undershield. I like the attention to detail here from the way the relay box is placed and organized and also the small rubber grip on the bonnet stay that protects your fingers when the whole engine bay is hot. I've had one issue already in this area and that has been fixed under warranty. The car had developed a very small rattle at idling speeds. This was diagnosed to be due to a faulty driver's side engine mount. I really like the time and patience given by the DM Hyundai technician in test driving and then diagnosing the problem. The part was not in stock but was ordered within 3-4 to four days and I was called back for the replacement. The problem has not recurred since. In terms of numbers, the engine produces an excellent 120 PS and 17.5 kgm of torque. The torque is nothing spectacular when compared to a diesel, but the power output combined with the quick responding DCT makes for brisk performance. One of the major talking points as well as concerns about the venue has been the DCT transmission. It uses two clutches to engage odd and even numbered gears and is designed to minimize the time between gear shifts and the associated lack of efficiency. It works brilliantly for the most part with rapid gear changes and seamless performance. The problems arise when you drive this type of transmission in heavy traffic under extreme heat. If you try and fill up every little gap in traffic, that means foot on and foot off the brake constantly, what you're essentially doing is engaging and disengaging the clutches. Secondly, since you're crawling or creeping forward, you're modulating the pressure on the brake pedal. This has the same effect as essentially half clutching or riding the clutch in, on a manual car. Your dual clutch system has the potential to overheat in this circumstance. This has nothing to do with the venue or Hyundai. It is the inherent design of the DCT transmission. The solution, keep your foot firmly on the brake when stopped and instead of barging into every small gap, make sure-footed and substantial advances when in heavy traffic and extreme heat. It may sound complicated but really isn't. I could literally feel the clutches struggling when driven incorrectly and completely at ease when driven in the right manner. What does all this mean for a prospective buyer? My recommendation is as follows. If your daily drive consists of stop-start traffic and this is the main objective of buying an automatic car, avoid a DCT equipped car and instead choose one of the older or the other technologies such as CVT, torque converters or even AMT or IMT. But this type of usage, if it's only a fraction of your intended driving pattern, wholeheartedly choose the DCT and enjoy the benefits and perks that come with this technology. Enjoy lightning fast gear shifts and stellar fuel economy and simply adapt your driving style when you come across that bottleneck in the peak of summer. Now whenever I look at the dashboard of the venue, I feel that it's a very uninspired design. Even compared to other recent Hyundai models, the way the air vents have been designed is boring and lacks flair. It's undoubtedly plasticky and if there's any salvation, it's the fact that the quality of materials used is generally good. And also the steering wheel is good to look at and to hold. The climate control unit, a shared component with other Hyundais, 
and similar to the new Swifts, also looks good with its circular dial design and feels good to operate. The front seats are comfortable for the most part. I say this because you will have little cause for complaint in the city and the bucket shape is well defined, holding you in place. The seat squab is short, so there is little thigh support. On longer journeys, the lack of proper upper back support becomes apparent and this results in your back feeling tired and unsupported. The rear seats are comfortable in themselves, but marred by a lack of legroom. This is the venue's biggest criticism. There is a serious lack of space at the back, especially with a taller driver up front. If you regularly carry passengers in the rear, it may be better for you to look at lower models of the Creta or the Kia Seltos instead. Headroom is generally good all around, despite the sunroof eating into some space, but the scooped out roof liner ensures that even taller passengers will not brush their heads against the roof when sat at the rear. What you lose in rear legroom, you gain in boot space. At around 350 liters, it's one of the generous sized ones in this segment. The XUV300 takes the opposite approach. It trades around 100 liters of boot space for better rear legroom. Which one is more suited to your needs, I will leave to you to decide. There's one more thing I have to criticize here, and that's the board used for the floor of the boot. Here's what it looks like in just one year of use. Sure, I may have carried some water here that would have leaked and soaked this board in the process, but such disintegration is both undesirable and unexpected. It needs to be much thicker, stronger and resilient to be able to carry heavy and messy loads that boots are often subject to. The sunroof is small but at least ticks that box in the features list and is increasingly seen as almost a mandatory feature nowadays, especially if your competitors offer it. Special mention needs to be made about the climate control air conditioning system of the venue. It is super efficient and chills the cabin in no time. Even on the hottest days, it will cool you down in less than 10 minutes. It's so effective that sometimes I feel it even beats out the aircon on my Fortuna in peak summer. And that's saying something. It's a true 10 on 10 in the AC department. Actually, maybe a 9.5 out of 10 because the flow from the rear air vents is not that strong. But having them there is a boom, even in such a small car. There is an air purifier that looks like a small gym bottle in front of the center armrest. The idea is sound, but this early implementation is not ideal. It gets pushed on, rested on, knocked about and yanked at during the course of use and at service stations. The later Kretas and Seltos' inbuilt design is much better, in my opinion. The center console has a general lack of storage space. And since the extreme front is used as a wireless charging pad, you only get a small receptacle behind the gear lever that is mostly used by the key if you choose to take it out of your pocket. You're then left with the slippery indent above the glove box that is of little use for the driver. One of the two available glass holders is taken up by the air purifier and since the dealership's complimentary air freshener takes up the other one, I'm practically left with no cup holders at all. There are three USB Type-A charging ports in the center console and one is used for communication with the infotainment system and offering a trickle charge to your phone. Because Apple CarPlay and Android Auto require the use of a cable, it's quite awkward to place your phone once a wire is connected because of the shape of the wireless charging pad station. But it's good to see enough ports for both driver and passenger. There is a cigarette lighter socket for the rear seats as well. Now, let's talk about the infotainment system and the connected features of the venue. This has been a unique talking point about the car and some of the features are genuinely useful. The 8-inch touchscreen uses an SD card based mapping system that is quite adept at giving you directions and the maps used are also usable. I tried out the voice activated search and it does work for simpler addresses that the system can recognize and identify. However, most people will use either the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto based navigation features and phone functions. Both of these work well and the icons are big, legible and usable whilst driving. The DRVM or Driving Rear View Mirror app displays the rear camera even when not in reverse gear. So you can use it to check if that pesky motorist has gotten too close to your rear bumper or not. You also get a row of physical shortcut buttons below the screen 
and I find this especially useful while driving as you can touch them by memory without taking your eyes off the road. I've programmed the star button to take the system home, somewhat like a iPhone home button. The app itself offers a number of functions, chief of which is a tracker. It uses a Vodafone SIM card that is free of charge for the first three years. The app also offers a My Trip section that shows a calendar of trips taken in your venue. Parameters such as the duration of the drive, distance, average speed and maximum speed are available to view for each day. The VHR section shows the vehicle health report and flags anything that needs your attention. However, I suspect that this needs resetting by the service center at every service and this was not done for me in the last 10,000 km service that my venue has just had, so it's displaying alerts for common service items. You then get a remote control for the vehicle. Here, you can unlock and lock the car, start the engine, set the climate control, sound the horn and turn on the lights and stop the engine. You can cool your car using this feature on hot summer days, but only up to a maximum of 10 minutes. It also shows the status of the car and its various components, so you can ensure that the car is locked with the engine off all remotely. You can connect this app to a smartwatch too. Personally, I like to use the tracking features of the app a lot and also to review the journey on a long trip to check the metrics. Also, since the silly Hyundai alarm does not allow you to unlock the car without making a loud horn noise, I use the app to unlock the car when I want to be discreet. So immediately when you start driving the uh, venue in an urban environment where there's a lot of traffic and you know stop-start maneuvers having to uh, turn the steering left and right you see that the steering is ultra light as with most Hyundai's and that is actually a boon it's an asset when driving in the city and it really helps you uh, in terms of ease of driving and uh, reduction of stress on the driver so you don't get tired after driving this car in the city it also has compact dimensions so it can easily uh, go through small areas where there's not much space on the road so the suspension of the venue is not very supple it's a stiff suspension you can feel most of the undulations bumps potholes that you will go through but uh, I mean, I personally like this setup because it gives you more precise handling when going around corners and you know, generally it's a tighter car to drive. So you feel nice driving it around bends and you know, when you're driving enthusiastically. So I'll also share the uh, fuel efficiency that the MID tells us um, on this particular drive, how it's done. So you'll be able to see that basically since I've started driving, like right now, I've only driven 1.4 kilometers from a cold engine and um, it's only driven at crawling speeds around these roads. So currently it's not doing much, it's doing 1.7 kilometers per liter. But as we approach the main roads, this should improve and that's what we are testing currently. So the transition from the lanes, the by-lanes of the colony that I live in to this uh, major road was very seamless. The car has enough grunt, you know, to seamlessly blend in the traffic and then if you need to overtake someone, it's effortless in that sense as well. So, I mean, I can reassure you in that respect that in the 14 months that I've had the car, it has never ever overheated. and. Although I don't commute uh, in heavy traffic every day, I have taken it in many situations where there's been heavy traffic. And uh, I will show you the gauge, the temperature gauge in the instrument cluster. This uh, shows the temperature of the transmission and it climbed up to above the halfway point, but it never went or never overheated. So if that was your concern, then you know you can rest assured that if uh, driven sympathetically, then it will not overheat in most situations. The point to note here is that since Hyundai has actually given that temperature gauge, it means that it is something to watch out for. So inherently, cars with dual clutch transmissions 
they can have that problem of the transmission heating up. It's for the simple reason that two clutches are always ready to be deployed. So there's one clutch handling the odd numbered gears and the other handling the even number gears. And depending on the engine speed, the ECU of the engine will guide the, and the transmission also has an ECU. So it will guide the car on what gear to select. So because it's doing that constantly, it's keeping that uh, clutch ready for the gear to be deployed. So it's a bit like, you know, you could say that in situations where it requires frequent gear changes, it's almost like riding the clutch. So when uh, you ride the clutch, that tends to overheat the clutch system in a manual car. Similarly here, uh, this is meant for efficiency and speed, but if it's if, uh, if the conditions are not favorable, then what will happen is that the uh, clutches will constantly engage, disengage, engage, disengage. That is what makes, that is what generates heat and that is what uh, raises the temperature. And um, this is a dry clutch, so it's a DCT uh, transmission, dry clutch type. There is also a wet clutch type uh, that some VWs use. Uh, VWs also use DCTs uh, that are dry. So DSG and DCT, by the way, is talking about the same type of transmission. It's just uh, different terminology used by different car companies. Basically, the um, transmission technology is the same, but they have a fluid inside the gearbox to ensure that you know there is better heat dissipation, better lubrication of the components. So ultimately. I would say that is a longer lasting transmission but uh, at the same time it adds weight, it adds complexity and um, it adds cost. So a lot of manufacturers do not choose to equip their cars with this kind of transmission. So that is one of the reasons that um, you know Hyundai has chosen to go for the dry clutch type DCT. And it's not that new a technology, even for Hyundai. They've had models in the US and some other markets like Korea. Since 2016, they've had this uh, six-speed DCT. This is another variant. This is a seven-speed dual clutch transmission. So if we talk about the performance, it's quite peppy for a one liter engine with 120 bhp, aided no doubt by the light weight of the car. And uh, as soon as you press the accelerator, if it's in the right rev zone, it will completely fly. So I don't know if you can hear that uh, raspy engine note. Really, really fun to drive and listen to. Once it's in the right power band, it simply flies. It's really, really good fun in that zone. So currently we're in sixth gear at 60 kilometers an hour and it was around 1400 RPM. So that aids in the uh, fuel efficiency. Mind you, this is not a fuel efficiency run that I'm doing, so it will not post good figures. Past 3000 RPM, third gear, and it's gone to 90 kilometers an hour touched 100 so it really comes alive after 2000 rpm at 5000 rpm and it reaches 100 so really really quick to reach 100 kilometers an hour so overall it's a very very gutsy engine it makes all the right kind of noises it has a raspy engine note so that means it's very entertaining to drive you know if you can really stretch to any variant of the uh, 1.0 turbo it is by far the best engine that the venue has because it offers a good mix of economy and performance and um, i would really really advise against the 1.2 liter the one that comes in the i20 or the i10 uh, because you know with a heavier curb weight of the venue not by much but still and uh, if you really want to exploit the dynamics of this chassis it's you should be uh, really looking at the 1.0 turbo engine and all the performance that it offers 
it's it's actually really really good fun i mean i'm running out of road space here before i uh, you know reach the upper ends of the performance envelope braking again is a very strong forte of this car the braking the bite force is excellent and the car comes to a stop when you want it to this year the venue has received a bs6 update and the power output of the 1 liter turbo petrol has remained unchanged the diesel venue now gets the celtos's 1.5 liter unit and although due to detuned it offers 10 bhp and 20 nm more than the outgoing 1.4 engine prices are generally up by 20000 rupees in other areas you can now get the dual tone paint with the dct gearbox there's also the new imt variant and the sport trim the differences and the pros and cons for each variant is perhaps the subject of another video as it's too exhaustive to talk about here but just know this Hyundai still doesn't offer the DCT in the top SX O trim and that means it misses out on some key features Now it's not possible to review the venue without talking about the sonnet which is just days away from reveal straight off where the venue design has mellowed in the past year the sonnet looks way more striking and eye catchy Kia's designs have more drama in general than Hyundai so if this is something you seek then the sonnet is clearly more suitable the engines and platform is the same so the driving experience will largely be similar the one area where Hyundai easily trumps Kia is the service center availability having some 20 odd years difference in the country launch dates so for peace of mind the venue still is and will continue to be a stronger proposition than the sonnet for quite some time also the parts availability at least initially will be a lot better having been in the market for over a year really it will be about the design and since this is subjective it will depend on individual tastes you can't go wrong with either so it's still great to have a choice even within the same parent company's offerings the venue currently offers no less than 23 different variants with prices ranging from 7.69 to 13.17 lakh on road in gurgaon so obviously it caters to a vast range of requirements at different market price points to do justice to this i will create another video drilling down the best choices for each price point but this particular variant of the venue cost 13.17 lakh on road i purchased mine on the 4th of june last year for 12.69 lakh so bs6 upgradation and other price hikes have certainly caused a significant increase Hyundai has recently launched the IMT variant of the Venue that adds and doesn't replace another variant in the lineup. Essentially this is a manual car with a sensor on the gear lever that sends a signal to an actuator to change gears. It's neither an automatic nor a true manual. And if I look at how rarely I use the manual shift gears on my DCT gearbox, I'd say it's best to steer clear of this variant. Change gears yourself if you want that control and go for the manual version. Otherwise get the excellent DCT that still gives you the option to to change gears manually the xuv 300 the ford eco sport the tata nexon and the maruti vitara brezza are amongst the venue's chief rifles uh, i think that the brezza and especially the eco sport are a bit too old as products to compete on an equal scale to the newer products the xuv 300 the nexon and soon the sonnet truly represent excellent alternatives to the venue again no one car is perfect and uh, for everyone depending on likes and dislikes these they can make a good choice personally i would still choose the venue for its combination of new design excellent engine and transmission superb air conditioning and generally the best service experience amongst all these available options The biggest negative of the venue is the rear seat space. There is a genuine lack of space in the second row of seats, although the seats themselves are quite comfortable. However, even more glaring is the lack of a top variant for the DCT variant of the venue. This means you are given stepmotherly treatment if you buy this variant in terms of safety features. You don't get side and curtain airbags. Why? Simply why? When you're spending top dollar, you must get access to the best safety features on offer. The 4-star ANCAP rating is meaningless on any variant except the top manual SXO. Same thing for the rear wash wiper. Why can't we get that in the DCT? What market research has Hyundai done and what has shown them that customers are not willing to pay more for these essential safety items? It's simply inexcusable. Quality in certain items such as the boot floorboard needs improving. Also, the suspension components while beefier than a normal cars are not abuse friendly. Drive too fast over broken stretches and rattles in the steering and suspension can develop. So in the end, what we have here is a complete package. Now obviously, no car is perfect in every sense and nor is it suitable for everyone. It is the same with the venue. If you want a big SUV with lots of seating and you want even more creature comforts than the already extensive list of the venue provides, 
provides, then this is obviously not for you. Also, I think the Hyundai designers ran out of inspiration when it came to the dashboard and ergonomics design. But for the rest, if you want a fun to drive, contemporary subcompact SUV from a well-established manufacturer that has an extensive service network, the venue is an excellent choice. It's one of the most modern offerings and brings together various facets of car ownership nicely together to form an overall, overall satisfying experience. If all these things appeal to you, go right ahead and buy it. You will have a great time with this car. Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe if you like this content. See you in my next one.